The Night of Reckoning delivered a humiliating blow. At home at Kirribilli House on November 24th, Prime Minister John Howard watched the election coverage with his family, his closest friends and his longtime chief of staff. It wasn't going to be good, he didn't think. Um, he was preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Um, Nick mentioned. I've been a strong Howard supporter for a very long time, and I really was anxious to see John Howard go out on top. By 9 p.m., the Howard government was gone, and it was clear the Prime Minister would lose his own seat as well. I think he had steeled himself for that. He was quite stoic about it. Um, and, and then when he came to the decision, it's all over, he sort of just said, well, that's it then, I'm dead meat. John Howard headed to the Wentworth Hotel to front the party faithful, many still fiercely loyal to the end. For over 10 years, this man dominated the country, the airwaves and his party. Now he has gone quiet speaking to no media outlets since the loss. But tonight on Four Corners, his political allies and his longtime foes go public, revealing the backroom machinations as John Howard led them to electoral annihilation. Could there be a harder phone call than ringing a Prime Minister and saying, I think, I think time's up? It, it's, it's hugely difficult. I got uh, reports of what was going on. And what was that? What were you being told? Uh, what I was being told was I'd better get ready because um, there could be a change of leadership. Whatever the rights or wrongs of that, they are the facts. There was no change of leader. Three months after these scenes of grief, Liberal insiders talked to Four Corners frankly as never before about the role John Howard's leadership played in that loss. Um, look, I think on the leadership issue, there's such a, a long history to it, you wouldn't know wh where to begin. To start to understand the long-term bitterness over leadership, take a brief journey back in time. It's December 1994, the last sitting week of Parliament before the Christmas break. Alexander Downer was opposition leader, Peter Costello was his deputy, and Downer's leadership was faltering. Are there circumstances under which he would consider resigning as leader of the opposition for the good of the party, for example? No. OK. Thank you. Just one more question. That was it. Liberal frontbencher Ian McLaughlin set up a secret meeting. We were in uh, plenty of trouble. Um, Alexander Downer was... Um, had to go. Uh, the party was talking about that and the question was how and who would replace him. We'd been through Peacock, Howard, Peacock, Hewson, Downer. <laughs> so I was the next person in line and a lot of people thought I should have uh, uh, nominated for the leadership. The secret meeting was arranged for late in the evening of the 5th of December. John Howard and Ian McLaughlin came to Peter Costello's office. Only these three men know what was said. John asked me not to uh, nominate for the leadership so that he could be elected unopposed, uh, which would uh, give us the best opportunity of winning the 1996 election. Uh, he indicated to me that um, he only wanted to serve one and a half terms. Uh, obviously, I didn't ask him for an undertaking. This was something that he volunteered. He was with Ian McLaughlin. Peter was very reluctant to agree. As it turned out, he was right, wasn't he? But uh, he was very reluctant. Uh, but I think that he knew, or he knew within a day or so anyway, that he probably didn't have the numbers. A few days later, McLaughlin made a note 
of what he took to be agreed in this room. Undertaking given by John Howard in Peter Costello's room that if Alexander Downer resigned and Howard became PM, then one and a half terms would be enough and he would hand over to Peter Costello. We now learn the note was Costello's idea. I made a note because Costello said to me one day, I think we better make a note of that arrangement. And I said, good idea. So I just wrote it out on a piece of paper and tore it off and I stuck it in my wallet. Why did you suggest that? I thought uh, we ought to know what was actually said. Early in 1995, around eight weeks after the Howard Costello meeting, John Howard was elected unopposed as leader of the Liberal Party. Peter Costello remained as deputy. Now, let me undo my uh, yeah. check. Yeah. Do the, same. the new leadership team posed for the cameras to show they were cobbers. Okay. Well, cobber, how was yeah. the cricket? Pretty good. Yeah, I think we'll win this one too. Although they, they we might. We've got to get, we'll probably have to get about 200, 280. A bit more natural, just chatting together. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. It's a great yeah, meeting, know. wasn't it? It yeah. was a good meeting. Yeah, it was very good. Very good. Yeah, very excellent. Fast forward to March 2006. The Liberal and National Party luminaries, past and present, are arriving for a gala banquet. They've come to celebrate the 10th anniversary of John Howard's term as their leader and as Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> Treasurer Peter Costello is still waiting for his turn. So how much longer are you going to have to wait to be the leader? Well, I'm just about to go into dinner and I'm going to enjoy it very much, thanks. <laughs> John Howard is at the peak of his power. He has won four elections for his party and been Prime Minister longer than any other person by his hero, Sir Robert Menzies. The clearest public signal of precisely when he might retire was a comment Howard made on his 61st birthday, that nothing is forever. Come his 64th birthday, he'd consider his political future. What was your feeling then in June 2003, a month before the 64th birthday? Well, then, the of course, the, the time that that came, wasn't. you know, for the 64th birthday in uh, June of 2003, and uh, he decided to stay on. Uh, I discussed this with him at the time, uh, and uh, he made his decision. He decided to stay on and went to the 2004 election. When you say you discussed it, did you remind him of the meeting in 1994? Uh, I had um, a very open and frank discussion with him. But by the time of Howard's 10th anniversary, serious talk of change was in the air. The chatter reached Howard's chief of staff, Arthur Sinodinus. I was aware there was chatter going on around the place and speculation about what might happen. Fed as usual, assiduously by the press. Um, about the leadership, yeah, there, there was speculation. There was speculation around the time of the 10th anniversary. Was it always a difficult issue to approach the Prime Minister directly on? Well, it's not the sort of thing that people would raise in the normal course of conversation with the Prime Minister. I mean, it's, it's not an issue that you raise with him walking down the corridor. You know what I mean? What very few people knew was that four months earlier, Alexander Downer had spoken with a senior Cabinet colleague about John Howard's retirement. That's just great. Both Downer and Arthur Sinodinus had been approached to tell the Prime Minister it was time for him to go. The approach came from Senator Nick Minchin. If you study the history of politics, uh, it is unfortunately the fact that most leaders um, don't get the timing right. 
and I really was anxious as a Howard loyalist to see John Howard go out at the top of his game. And I thought, you know, that the, the, the 10th anniversary, then which was at that point three or four months away, was the ideal time. And I thought if I could persuade Arthur and Alexander to that view, then, that there might be some prospect um, that that could occur. And I thought that would be healthy both for John Howard and probably for the government, given that the greatest obstacle we would face at the 2007 election was obviously longevity. He did approach you to approach the Prime Minister? Well, he talked to me um, on more than one occasion about the issue of the, of the leadership. He didn't ask me to approach the Prime Minister. He talked to me, I suppose, in the full knowledge that there was every chance I might speak to the Prime Minister. I spoke well, and to convey Prime his views? Well, I guess he made that assumption, yeah. And did you? Well, I talked to the Prime Minister about any manner of things. The Prime Minister confirmed to me that Arthur did convey his view and I know that Alexander told me that he told the Prime Minister. Now, it was then for the Prime Minister, if he wanted to do so, to invite me in to ask me why I had that view. Um, not for me to barge in and just tell him. Um, and he um, did not seek to have that conversation with me, so that, that's fine. That's, so what's so the there. feedback that you got from either Mr Downer or Mr Sendadinas? Oh, well, it, clearly, <laughs> because the Prime Minister didn't retire, uh, he wasn't persuaded of that. As I said to you, neither. Certainly Downer was not persuaded of that view. Arthur's one of those wonderful guys you're never quite sure what he thinks. Peter Costello was one of the few who knew what Minchin had done. He had certainly told me that was his view and you know, I thought he'd passed that on to John Howard, yes. And did he make clear to you that he thought that you should be the successor? Yes, well, that was essentially what he was saying, yes. Arthur Sinodinus was for nine years Howard's chief of staff. He resigned at the end of 2006. Hello, Arthur, how are you, mate? Good. Did you ever talk to the Prime Minister in either 2005 or 2006 about leadership issues and whether or not a time might come when it might be he, in his own interest and the party's interest? He raised down? he raised the issue with you at various times. Oh, not just mm. with me, with various but with people. With you, yeah. Um, and I think his attitude was uh, he wanted to, to think it through for himself. But uh, part of what I'm saying is that, uh, in a sense, that process ended up being truncated by the McLaughlin affair. Come 2006, mm. in July, we get the so-called McLaughlin yeah. affair. Did you have any intimation this was this was coming? No, no none at all. Totally as a, as a shock to Peter Costello and all of those people who've been associated with Peter Costello. You knew nothing about it in advance? Nothing at all. In the middle of 2006, July the 9th to be precise, Liberal politicians woke up to read this headline in their Sunday paper. Exclusive. Proof John Howard agreed to hand over leadership to Peter Costello. Glenn Milne's article finally revealed the fact of the secret meeting held 12 years before and quoted Ian McLaughlin as saying he had notes that confirmed that an undertaking had been given. Did you speak with Peter Costello before the article came out, before you made that I spoke with him when I thought I might bring Glenn back and say, yeah, I think I'm... I think I might tell Milne that... Um, and he said, if you want to do that, that's fine. Any more to that conversation? Well, well no more in essence. It might take longer than that. But he'd come to the conclusion he was sick of holding it in, in for all this time as well. I mean, we'd known about this thing since 1994. And we'd had a few conversations. And um, I said, surely, you know, it'll happen in the next halfway through or towards the end of the next term. And, and it didn't. And then again, it didn't. Then we get to the last one. And, uh, and it didn't. So he and thought it was a good idea to bring it to a head in well, he 2006 was relaxed. He was as well. Relaxed, but, well, he wasn't all that relaxed because he knew it would create an enormous fracas. I, 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 look, it wasn't a matter for me. It was a matter... Uh, he wanted to confirm this. He'd lived with this. He thought that, you know, history ought to know it. He was going to put it out. He'd shown many people about it. 
Uh, but he asked you. Uh, well, I, it wasn't up to me. It was up to him. The next morning, the fracas was on. All right, are you ready? The Prime Minister and his Treasurer publicly disputing each other's account, with the implications that one of them was lying amid allegations of a deal reneged. Well, the situation is very simple. There was no deal made. There were lots of discussions at that time, including one in which Mr McLaughlin was present. Uh, uh, that did not involve the conclusion of a deal. Tell me when you're all ready. Well, there's been a lot in the papers the uh, last couple of days, uh, and I've never spoken about these events, uh, but since uh, others have, the public uh, is entitled to know the full truth. I did not seek that undertaking. He volunteered it, and I took him at his word. Uh, obviously, that did not happen. Could you describe the atmosphere in the party once it became front-page news a year or so out from an election? Oh, well, look, it'd be, it, it, you know, it'd be silly for me to deny that it was devastating for the government and the party to have its leader and deputy leader uh, in the public arena, having a public spat over events that occurred, you know, many years before. That was very unfortunate and very difficult period for the government. By the time of the Cabinet meeting, 48 hours after the story broke, there was a press pack mobbing Peter Costello. He could not resist this barb directed at John Howard at the doorstop. I spoke yesterday and I gave you the full details. My parents always told me, if you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear by telling the truth. At the end of the Cabinet meeting, there was a half-hour discussion, just Costello and Howard. The third question, did he ask you to stand aside before the election? Uh, Mr Costello obviously would like to see a leadership change in his favour before the election. Um, I have indicated to him that, as I have always indicated, that in the end, uh, it is the will of the party and the interests of the party that is paramount. You know, as someone who has a genuine affection for Peter Costello, um, there is no doubt that he did not handle the thing particularly well, and I think he'd admit that now. Um, if he'd sort of shrugged his shoulders and let it go through to the keeper, uh, things might have worked out differently. As it was, John Howard responded by announcing in July 2006 that his leadership was locked in until after the next election, barring a major shift of mood. It is the very strong view of the Liberal Party, indeed the overwhelming view of the Liberal Party, that the current leadership team with me as leader and Peter Costello as deputy leader should remain in place uh, through to the next election. Was there ever a real possibility that he would have stood down in the middle of the McLaughlin affair? I don't think he was ever going to stand down. What, 2006, 2007, I ever? Don't, I don't think he was ever going to stand down. I think from time to time he would consider his position. You recall he said he would consider it when he was 64. Uh, I think he decided he'd consider it in the next term, and I think every time he considered it, he decided he was going to stay. I, I appreciate that, and and Peter's um, certainly of of the view that um, that um, the prime minister didn't have any intention of retiring at any time. I'm my, it was my sense. I, I can only tell you, look, what what was my, my what my sense was that um, had. Had it been a controversy-free year in 2006, um, that, uh, that I think that John Howard yeah. would have retired at the end of 2006. Alexander Downer has told us that if that incident hadn't happened, if the whole McLaughlin affair had not blown up, that it's his view that the Prime Minister would have retired in December 2006. Well... I never had any inclination of that. I never had any indication at all that, uh, that he was retiring in 2006. In fact, quite the contrary. Is your exit. Peter Costello knew that had he challenged Howard in 2006, he'd have lost. Howard always easily had the numbers. It is clear to me that most people 
including public and colleagues, do not support a leadership transition at the current time. Costello puts it down to Howard's longevity in office. A lot of the people in the party room, maybe even a majority by this stage, had come into the party whilst he'd been the leader. They knew nothing else. They, they, they didn't know a leader other than Howard. And for those people, particularly people who'd been elected since 1996, uh, the Liberal Party was Howard. So uh, if you had said to them, oh, well, would you like to have a, a Liberal Party with a different leader, they would have thought, well, uh, we, we can't comprehend it. Senator, good morning. Have you had a chance to... Liberal Senator Judith Troth has had her differences with John Howard, but she's not a Costello supporter. I think he hasn't taken the opportunity to uh, cultivate anyone but a small band of supporters, ministers and cabinet ministers. And I think perhaps uh, he treated other people with a degree of disdain. And I think that led to a degree of unpopularity which would put into doubt his qualities as leader. What do you say to the critics, both within the party, but also in terms of the commentary, who say that you never had the guts to actually mount a challenge, to fight for the leadership and to fight to win an election in your own right? Oh, I'm entitled to their views. I suppose i just make the observation, you know, seldom does a leadership change end up without blood on the floor. On December the 4th, 2006, Kevin Rudd challenged Kim Beasley for the leadership of the Labor Party and won, promising new leadership. Kevin, a sense of relief after the vote. We'll be talking soon. Yes. I suspect the view within the coalition at the time was, well, he's a new leader, he's been inexperienced, come out of left field in one sense. Uh, and we'll wait and see what he's like. but. Uh, I don't think there was a sense of panic when Kevin took over the leadership of the Labor Party. Do you think the government yourself and the Prime Minister included underestimated him? Well, I think by definition, if he's won the election, that yes. I think the answer is yes. You don't have to be Einstein to work out that their polling told them that new leadership is what the public wanted. Um, we mistakenly believed that we could get through the election without offering new leadership we didn't have the option uh, of providing a fresh face. We could have provided a different face, but not a face that was fresh in the sense that Kevin Rudd was fresh. So Peter Costello could not have been that fresh face? Uh, my view was that at all times, Howard was our best asset. Uh, the polling never suggested that a change of leadership would have helped us. Uh, the polling always suggested that a change in leadership would have harmed us. From the time Rudd became leader, there was something like 50 polls that showed Labor would win. 50 zip. Not a single poll showed the government would win from 2006 on. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, hi, Mr White. The federal government is scrapping unfair dismissal laws for 3.6 million workers. Um, no, sorry, I can't. I'm rostered on for tomorrow night's shift. Early in 2007, the government did move on policies the polls showed were hurting them, issues other than leadership. You can't sack me. Work choices was high on the list. Really? The union ads were hitting home. He was going to sack me if I didn't come in. The fact of the matter is, Mr Speaker, a new Minister for Workplace Relations was appointed to repair some of the damage done. Joe Hockey's problem was that under the new laws, some people would be losers. Quite frankly, uh, when I took over the job, I don't think uh, many ministers in Cabinet were aware that you could be worse off under work choices uh, and that you could actually have certain conditions taken away without compensation. Uh, and once I started to raise those issues with colleagues uh, 
and they became more informed of the impact of work choices, so uh, we introduced the fairness test. You, you're saying to me that Cabinet colleagues were unaware that you could be worse off? Some were, yeah. Yep. Care to name them? No, not really. <laughs> not really. I think it was a, the most powerful symbol of the fact that we had stopped listening and that we'd run our race and that we'd been there so long that we were no longer alert to the views of the Howard Battlers, the people who'd put us there in the first place. It's April 2007, with the election drawing closer. John Howard is arriving to deliver a big picture speech on the future of the nation and the challenges in the decades ahead. The protesters have a message of their own. Howard's oh, time is up. His time is over. We're going to push him out. We're going to push out work choices. And we think that the Australian people have been right on standing up for real solutions for the environment, for climate change, not this mad nuclear power push for 25 nuclear plants. The Prime Minister talks about climate change as one of the many challenges ahead, but does not mention the word Kyoto. Do we need to lower carbon emissions over time? Of course we do. But to say that climate change is the overwhelming moral challenge for this generation of Australians is misguided at best and misleading at worst. Do you think that you should have ratified Kyoto? Well, I think people would have listened to what we were doing, which was quite substantive, on climate change if we had have ratified it by, by meeting the target. We were meeting what our obligation would have been anyway. So did you back Malcolm Turnbull when he suggested that Kyoto be ratified before the election? Well, I actually think that the time for ratification was much earlier than that. Having, when it first came up, uh, endorsed the target, the time for ratification was then. With the wisdom of hindsight, uh, I think that would have been the right thing to do. That was many years earlier. I can fully understand John Howard's position on this, but with the wisdom of hindsight, I don't think it helped us at all. He should have changed his view on that. Well, point. look, um, uh, there's no, there's, there's nothing easy uh, about changing your position on a totemic issue, and uh, I'm not saying that uh, if we had changed it, uh, it would necessarily have saved our bacon. Uh, but certainly, as far as the public were concerned, the voting public were concerned, I think our position looked odd. It's Monday, September the 3rd, the night before the APEC summit. In the coming days, Sydney will be hosting 20 world leaders, including the presidents of Indonesia, Russia, China and the United States. But on the eve of the summit, domestic politics intrude. Tomorrow, as the US president flies in, John Howard will have a fresh opinion poll on his mind. And for the government, the result is not good. The news poll in tomorrow's Australian newspaper shows a four-point drop in the coalition's two-party preferred support. Labor's lead has stretched to 18 points. John Howard's personal support fell another two points. Yeah, it was a devastating poll, no doubt about that. Uh, and uh, I think it gave all of us uh, uh, a pause for thought. And we were getting closer and closer to when we had to have the election. That's why people were starting to get, you know, jumpy. Yeah, sure. The Honourable George Bush, President of the United States of America. The Honourable John Howard, Prime Minister of Australia. Over the following three days, as he hosted APEC, John Howard himself began to have doubts. He'd come to the view he would lose the election and probably lose his own seat as well. Thank you. Would APEC be a good time to bow out and pass on the leadership? Thank you. The Prime Minister consulted his closest friends and staunchest allies. 
rather intermittently because we had to be, John Howard and I had to spend time talking with President Bush and President Putin and um, President Hu Jintao and so on um, through APEC. So um, we didn't have as much time to devote to this as would have otherwise been the case, but we certainly talked about, canvassed all of the issues. I spoke uh, subsequent to the conversation with John Howard uh, to uh, Alexander Downer, to Nick Minchin and to Peter Costello and then to various other people. And uh, by the end of the afternoon and evening, I was convinced, as I always had been, that we should stick with the team we had. I said to Tony, look, you know that I thought that the Prime Minister's best option was to go in March of 06. Um, I now think it's far too late. Uh, and I told him that on the phone. I'm sitting in this office here. <laughs> I thought it was a silly idea. It was far too late to be changing leaders now. But significantly, Alexander Downer, John Howard's close friend, did not share that view. And three days into APEC, the leadership question remained unsettled. Howard asked Downer to sound out what other Cabinet members thought. We were doing very badly. Um, and we were, John Howard and I were of the view that we might lose the election. Um, and um, I was certainly pretty concerned about it and after all the election had to be called within weeks, within a very few weeks. And um, it was a reasonable thing that he wanted to um, sound out the views of his colleagues as to whether we would be better off um, changing leadership. And I did that. That night, Thursday the 6th of September, Alexander Downer invited eight of his cabinet colleagues to his suite at the Key Grand Hotel for a drink and a confidential chat. Brendan Nelson, Malcolm Turnbull, Julie Bishop, Philip Ruddock, Chris Ellison, Ian McFarlane, Kevin Andrews and Joe Hockey. Most had been outside the loop in terms of what the PM was now thinking and they were stunned by what Downer told them. We were very close to an election. I felt as though that I felt that the leadership issue had been dealt with, dealt with a year ago, uh, and uh, it, it was over. The fact that the prime minister was reopening the leadership issue was what stunned me and many of my colleagues. Did it make you feel that perhaps the time for change had come if he felt that he was beaten? Oh, absolutely. And and the universal view in the room was if the Prime Minister didn't think he could win the election and if the Prime Minister thought that he would lose his seat, then he should step aside. You're saying it was universal in the meeting? Hmm. That was... I, there might have been an occasional dissenting voice, but, but certainly the overwhelming view was that if the Prime Minister didn't think he could win, then we needed someone in that spot that thought they could win. It was a two-hour meeting much was discussed, and the following morning, Downer did a report back to Howard. I reported back to him um, that um, they were uh, all pessimistic, nearly all, not quite all. They were nearly all pessimistic about our chances of winning, and they... Um, and a lot of them thought that maybe if we changed leadership, who would know? Maybe we'd be worse off. Maybe it would make no difference, um, but that just maybe we'd have some chance of being better off and winning. I heard pretty, pretty soon afterwards. Pretty I soon got, I got uh, reports of what was going on. And what was that? What were you being told by Alexander Downer as the outcome of the meeting? That I'd better get ready because there could be a change of leadership. The day after the meeting, the media picked up on rumours and leaks. There is no other candidate for the Prime the Ministership and I think he is um, the best candidate. Would you tap him on the shoulder? Uh, what sort of a question is that? I think his leadership is in the best interest of the Liberal Party. <laughs> Alexander Downer gave a different message to his colleagues, a message from John Howard. That um, anyone who thought he should go should also ring the Prime Minister and say it to him directly or go and see him. And so? Well, I did. I thought uh, I wasn't going to have 
an intermediary give my views to the Prime Minister and I rang him up and gave him my view. How'd you put it? Uh, well, <laughs> how do you put it to a Prime Minister? Uh, you, 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 you're honest. Uh, like, you know, with the Australian people. And, and you know, I, I said, John, this is a very difficult conversation for me to have with you. Uh, I think you've been a great Prime Minister. But I think the Australian people have stopped listening because they don't think you're going to be around in the future. And therefore, when you talk about the future, they stop listening. And what did he say? He appreciated the honesty. He appreciated the fact that I rang him and was prepared to be fair dinkum with him. Uh, and uh, he heard what I said. On the Friday evening, Alexander Downer went to Kirribilli House for one of several conversations about where to from here. The message from the key grand meeting was that John Howard should leave, but leave voluntarily. And this became the sticking point that could not be resolved. John Howard took the view that um, he would leave if he was told to leave by his colleagues. Um, and his colleagues took the view um, that if they blasted John Howard out, um, that would be an electoral disaster that we would lose by even more and that Peter Costello would be, his leadership would be, would be stillborn. Unfortunately, you know, he wasn't told that he should go. He was told that, that people thought, thought in Cabinet that he, he should move on, but it was ultimately his decision. And so is it your view that the Cabinet colleagues should have said, well, OK, then, go? Yes, it is. Uh, John Howard had a significant personal core vote across the nation. If there had have been a, a knifing of John Howard as Prime Minister, uh, we would have been reduced to a small rump of seats in the federal parliament because our core voters would have gone and voted for Labor, outraged at the way that we had treated Australia's most successful Prime Minister. So in a sense he had that over you? Of course. You know, this is what I understood. I understood that uh, Downer had uh, reported to him that the Cabinet wanted a change. Uh, over the next few days there was a lot of discussion about what would be required and what the conditions were, and the conditions were not agreed. And as a consequence of that, John Howard decided to stay and contest the 2007 election. I understand... Something that I thought he would always do anyway. You thought there was no condition that he would ever meet? No, I thought he wanted to contest the 2007 election. Monday morning and leadership speculation was rife. Is John Howard still the best person to lead the coalition? Absolutely. Thank you. Can Is you... it time for Peter Costello? That night, John Howard tells Channel 7's Today Tonight he's staying put. Why do you want to continue? I mean, what makes you... Well, there are still things I want to do. And, I've, in fact, I've talked about my position with my own family at length last night. And what did you say to your well, family? Well, well they, they want me to continue to contribute. Uh, they, they, they support what I'm doing. That was his decision. I suppose I was disappointed, very disappointed, that the Prime Minister had always said that he would only stay so long as it was in the best interest of the Liberal Party and whilst his colleagues wanted him. And the formula changed. And he changed the formula. John Howard's view was that he wouldn't just stand down, he would not just stand down and run away from a fight and be seen by history as a coward, and secondly, that he himself thought that he had higher approval ratings than Peter Costello and a better chance of winning the election um, than Peter Costello. Now, whatever the rights or wrongs of that, they are the facts. Two months later, 
The same cabinet colleagues who'd asked John Howard to stand down rallied behind him as he launched the election campaign. Thank you very much. Ultimately, when John Howard blew the whistle, we all jumped out of the trenches and went into fight. Loyalty is very important in politics. It's very important in life. And uh, I don't think any of us were afraid of losing and were prepared to trade loyalty for losing. A few moments ago, I telephoned Mr Kevin Rudd and I congratulated him and the Australian Labor Party on a very emphatic victory. For John Howard to win again was never going to be easy. I think the reason for that was longevity in office. And the point is, whether any, a change of leader would have made any difference, who knows? The public gave Labor the biggest swing that they've ever had into government, uh, and that was the final say on uh, who was right about that. John Howard could never accept that he could be part of the problem. He loved the job too much. It has been an immense privilege every day of my life over the last 11 and a half years to have been the Prime Minister of this beautiful country. And I want to thank... He maintained most of his loyal supporters behind him to the end. From the very beginning of the government to its last day, uh, I thought John Howard was the best man to lead the team. The only other thing that I want to say, uh, that um, the Liberal Party, of course, will need to choose a new leader. Before bowing out, John Howard anointed Peter Costello as his heir apparent one last time. I've indicated very clearly from my early remarks who I believe it should be. I believe the future of our party does lie very much uh, with Peter Costello and others. Did Howard know that Peter Costello had already decided that if they lost, he no longer wanted the job. I don't think it came as a surprise. When did you tell him? Well, you got to remember, we'd had a lot of discussions over a long period of time. And just as I had a pretty fair idea what he would do, I think he had a pretty fair idea what I would do. I also want to say this, that I accept full responsibility for the Liberal Party campaign and I therefore accept full responsibility for the Coalition's defeat in this election campaign. After 11 and a half years as Prime Minister, this was Howard's end. You can watch extended interviews or see tonight's program again online. Just go to abc.net.au slash four corners. Promise me you won't overreact. When have I ever overreacted? The big rule of policing. I've seen cesspits with more brains. Never upset the gov. You might upset you do as I say. I'm hold ups. So you don't end up in my fire with mine. Road rage. It's all bound to tick off the boss.
Give me a shout if you need to slap. Life on Mars. He knows his onions, this lad, eh? Always a right little smart. Thursday, 8.30, ABC One. Wednesday. Give me time. <laughs> sing along with Spicks and Specks. I'm going to sing every one of them, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, come on, I'll leave. Got the kids in the car, we're going to go, love. <laughs> then at nine, Australian comedy with Stupid, Stupid Man. Can this life stuff be just a little bit about me too? Ripping open the sealed section of men's magazines. Mate, after three and a half years, premature could easily be your word for the day. That's Wednesday on ABC One. On ABC One tomorrow, a nail-biting case of life or death for our Chopper team. Please pull it off me. Chopper Rescue puts you in the cockpit. Thank you so much. Then, meet a new batch of brats. I'm just saying they will clothe me. And this time they're all girls. If you're watching this at home, you shouldn't send your kids here. The brand new series of Brat Camp. I love her to bits. I wish she was dead. On ABC One. <laughs> tomorrow. When you're at the end of a rope in 90k winds, it's good to know the guy at the other end can tie a knot properly. We've just heard the most... Uh upsetting news that Heath, actor Heath Ledger has been found hanged in an apartment in New York City. Uh, the news has only just come through. Uh, we'll, we knew about it a few minutes ago. We hope, Hopefully his family has heard about it uh, here in Perth. But uh, it's just hitting the news everywhere at the moment. Heath Ledger has been found hanged dead. in a New York found, apartment. Been found dead. I don't know about hanged. Oh, OK, sorry. Right. Uh, OK, thanks for that. Welcome to Media Watch 2008. I'm Jonathan Holmes. In fact, Heath Ledger's parents did reportedly hear about their son's death on Perth Radio. Let's hope they weren't listening to the bunch on Mix 94.5. I've spent most of my career on TV programmes like Four Corners and Foreign Correspondent, where reporters have the luxury of time to check their facts. Which doesn't mean I've always got it right. Back in 1991, for example, I reported for Four Corners, on the centenary of the Australian Labour Party. Happy birthday, dear Labour Party. In the past, Labour leaders like Billy Hughes and Jim Scullin have left the party altogether rather than follow the dictates of party platform. That was a historical howler, which Four Corners presenter, the late great Andrew Ollie, had to put right the following week. We met, of course, Billy Hughes and Joseph Lyons. Jim Scullin remained loyal to the ALP until his death in 1953. Uh, apologies to his memory and to you. Andrew's apology spared me a well-deserved roasting from the original media watcher, Stuart Littlemore. Now I get to operate the rotisserie. And first chook on the skewer is a man with a career even longer than mine, much of it with the ABC. Anyway, this comes to the point that men get excited easily. Men, when they've drunk a bit, want something, and they don't care much how they get it, which can lead to rape, right? Clive Robertson is in the wee small hours of a distinguished radio and television career. He does the graveyard midnight to dawn shift on Sydney's 2UE and Brisbane's 4BC, where he seems to have seriously lost his way. Take his views, for example, on the topic of rape. A lot of women say yes for who knows why, and I've mentioned before there's so much nowadays, they might as well get an ABM and just become a prostitute. In Robbo's view, the problem is that women these days insist on dressing to reveal what he coyly and revoltingly calls their bits. Men are easily stimulated by the visual. A lot of men who are dumb think if you go around showing your bits, you want something. That's why men think. That's as simple as that. She wants it. A feisty listener called Laura forced Clive to come clean. So who should take responsibility for the I rape? think if you've got a brain, you should actually... Oh, you... stop patronising people intellectually, Clive. You do not have the resources. Could you just answer the question? Why are you getting... Who should take responsibility for Both. the rape? Both. We pointed out to the management of 2UE that Clive Robertson's views on rape appear to contravene Commercial Radio Australia's own guidelines on the portrayal of women. Care should be taken when reporting instances of violence by men against women which might be seen to offer explanations to diminish men's responsibility for their actions. 
and even shift blame to the victim. But 2UE's Simon Rufus thought we were taking Robbo out of context. I believe care has been taken. Rape is a hypersensitive and precarious topic, but these shouldn't be reasons to avoid discussion of the topic. Throughout the course of this 45-minute on-air discussion on the topic, I don't think that Clive did seek to diminish men's responsibility. You don't, Mr Rufus? Remember the mad Mufti Sheikh Halali and his charming claim that unveiled women have the same effect on men as uncovered meat has on cats? That caused universal outrage. But Sheikh Rubbo makes precisely the same argument, only his version involves red dresses and balls. It's like a woman saying, I've got my red dress on, I should be able to walk across that paddock. It'd say, well, the bull will attack you. It shouldn't, I should be free to do it. You'd say, the reality is the bull doesn't know that. He will attack you. Say, well, it's not fair. All right, go. Oh, you've been hit by a bull. Who would have thought? Who indeed? Admittedly, talk radio hosts have a tough job. With hours of airtime to fill, they're easy prey for intriguing emails like this one. Subject. ADHD YouTube campaign to set the record straight. Especially when they're sent by a PR company with a soothing name. Ethical Strategies Public Relations Council. The email included a link to a series of video clips on YouTube. Each one purports to tackle a so-called myth about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Some say ADHD treatments lead to substance abuse. I say, attention to the facts. Mark Brantman has been diagnosed with ADHD and makes his living as a consultant on the condition. Some say ADHD treatment is addictive. I say, attention to the facts. His two sons, who both suffer from ADHD, also star in the clips. This is one of the more common and absurd ADHD myths. By YouTube standards, the clips are professionally shot and edited. Each one ends by sending viewers to this website. Living with ADHD. A family of ADHD sufferers brave enough to go public on YouTube. It proved an irresistible story to a swag of radio hosts, including the ABCs. By our count, five ABC stations, including Sydney's high rating 702, gave Mark Brantman airtime. Anne Dulaney of ABC Riverina in Wagga Wagga, for instance, spent nearly 20 minutes going through all nine of Brantman's myths one by one. Number five, still on medication, and this one's, a, this one's a corker. ADHD medication is kiddie cocaine. Boy, have we heard this one a lot. Yeah, so it used to be around a bit. I mean, um, it, it's, uh, it's methylphenidate. I guess that's, that probably, methyl probably hits people and they think, oh, is it that you know, ice or something? But certainly not. I mean, um, uh, the long-acting preparations that the government have, uh, uh, have uh, introduced onto the PBS, for instance, they cannot be abused. Long-acting preparations like what, for example? Well, like Concerta, a drug manufactured by the pharmaceutical company Janssen Sealag. Remember the website Living with ADHD, which Mark Brantman's YouTube clips link to? Guess who owns the copyright? Well done. It's right there on every page of the website. Yet not one of the ABC's radio hosts picked up on it or asked the obvious question. What role does Janssen Sealag play in your campaign, Mr Brantman? Mark Brantman and the PR company Ethical Strategies have both told us they have nothing to hide. The YouTube clips, they say, were Brantman's idea and were produced by Ethical Strategies. Mark Brantman goes on... Ethical Strategies was introduced to me by Jansen Selag, who covered the cost of the services this PR firm provided, which was greatly appreciated. Jansen Selag were equally upfront. We consider it our responsibility to support projects that aim to increase education, reduce stigma and support families living with ADHD. We are proud to support these projects and have always been open, transparent and honest about our association with advocacy groups. Well, yes, except nothing in Ethical Strategies or Mark Brantman's media releases or the YouTube clips mentions that a drug company paid for them. But you have to wonder if that's an ethical strategy. We're not suggesting Mark Brantman is anything but sincere in his attempts to destigmatize ADHD. And there's no mention of the drug Concerta, either in the YouTube clips or on the website Living with ADHD. 
But Mr. Brantman is an advocate of long-term medication for ADHD, and that in itself is controversial. Here's how the Sydney Sun-Herald's health reporter, Louise Hall, dealt with the story. New front opens in ADHD war. On one side of the page, an interview with Mark Brantman and his son Jack under the headline... Medications changed our lives for the better. On the other, a very different headline. Expert questions drug use as PBS costs soar. Much of that story was based on an editorial in the current issue of the Medical Journal of Australia, posted online one day before Mark Brantman's YouTube clips. The MJA raises new doubts about the long-term benefits of ADHD medication. In the long run, skills are as good as pills for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Not one of the ABC's interviewers put those doubts to Mark Brantman. They never even asked him who paid for the YouTube clips. The ABC's acting manager of local radio told Media Watch... ABC Local Radio agrees that it would have been preferable to tell listeners that the Living with ADHD website is sponsored by Janssen Seelag. Some say, hey, it filled the airtime. I say, attention to the facts. And we can't go tonight without a look back at the silly season's silliest story. Take off your I'll... glasses and apologise to us. I'll say sorry, but I'm not taking off my glasses. Why not? Because they're famous. Because your glasses are famous. Yeah. Well, we've got to go, but I suggest you go away and uh, take a good, long, hard look at yourself. I have. Everyone has. They love it. If you can't beat them, join them. And Layla McKinnon certainly hadn't beaten Corey Worthington. So, just ten days later, a current affair joined him and his celebrity agent. His new agent is none other than manager to the stars, Max Markson. Meet Corey Worthington. Hi, Corey. Hello. How are you? You need hey. some gear. Can you help him? Oh, most definitely. Let's get stuck into it. Now, Corey's got companies lining up to give him money, clothes and all the celebrity trimmings. One of those companies, of course, was Channel 9. They paid thousands of dollars for these scintillating scenes, which naturally shocked Today Tonight's executive producer, Craig McPherson, as he told Melbourne 3AW's Neil Mitchell. Did uh, Max Markson offer Corey to you? Yeah, he did. He offered, offered Corey to me Monday afternoon. How much? Yeah, we didn't actually get to talking figures. Um, I said, Max, how can anyone in their right mind pay for that kid, uh, given what he's done? Yet, remarkably, a week later, Craig McPherson had overcome his scruples and today, tonight, joined in for the great reconciliation spectacular as Corey finally went home. This 16-year-old is about to face the music. Corey, what are you expecting when you walk in the door? Um, not sure right now. Maybe a hello? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more than that? Uh, well, no, actually. Corey, how are you, mate? Come here. Mate. Are you OK? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. It's good to see you. Thank you. Come in, come in. Are you OK? Yeah. Talk about a fizzer. Today, tonight, says the money it paid went to the parents, not to Corey. I just hope they didn't pay too much. For more about tonight's stories or to tip us off about media muck-ups and misdemeanours, visit our website.